All righty. Hey there, it's Dr. Wong and Dr. DeVita at Southeast Veterinary Neurology. Uh, we're here to answer your questions about seizures, paralysis, balance problems, GME, uh, encephalitis, things like that for dogs and cats. Uh, so if you've got a question, feel free to submit it in the questions, excuse me, in the comments below. Um, we've got a couple uh, people that are already participating that will get to their questions first, but uh, Go ahead and put your, your questions below. Share this with uh, any of your friends or anyone you think that might find this interesting or useful. <clears throat> Just a couple disclaimers. Um, because we are unable to examine your pet and go over the record, just sometimes we have to be somewhat general in our, our answers. It's always best to follow the recommendations of your veterinarian that is able to see your pet in person, or if there's a veterinary neurologist in your area um, to, to go and meet with one of them. Just usually anything they're able to say after evaluating is just gonna be that much stronger a recommendation that we can give by uh, just doing this over the internet. That said, if you're local and you do want a consultation in person, call the office. If you just have a question, if you're watching this on the replay, um, it's best not to call the office. Just submit questions uh, either in the comments here and, and we uh, will answer them or email them to Q&A at SEV, like Southeast Veterinary, then the whole word neurology, N-E-U-R-O-L-O-G-Y dot com and we can get your question answered. So I believe the first person we have here is Katrina. I can hear you. Hello. Hello. You? Good afternoon. Thank you for having us. Of course. Thanks for getting on with us. Uh, I'm Dr. Wong. This is Dr. DeVita. And my name is Katrina. Uh, this is my daughter, Marta. And this is beautiful Maya. <laughs> oh, yeah. She's cute. So, Thank you. Tell us about Tell us about Maya, where, where, where are you? Um, how old is Maya? And, and what's been going on with Maya? And what's your question? Okay, so uh, we live on Long Island. Okay. Um, Maya, is she's gonna be seven years old in December. Okay. Um, about three years ago, she was diagnosed with this, that GME. Um, when she was first diagnosed, what made us, you know, take her to the doctor was like, she couldn't walk in a straight line. She just kept circling and circling. Um, she couldn't even stop to go to the bathroom. She couldn't urinate. Her head was um, like tilted very much to the side. Um, and then, um, so you know, she was diagnosed with this GME. She had MRI. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell them about the medicine. Yes, and sh uh, uh, since her diagnosis, she was put on the steroids. The one medication, it's called dexamethasone, okay. half a milligram, and atopica, 100 milligrams. This is uh, actually for cats because she's so tiny, so she's taking that, um, that atopica for cats. And um, initially, she was taking... A, a, that dexamethasone, I think twice a day, half a tablet. Um, later on, that dose was de decreased. And just um, before that last relapse, she was taking a quarter of the tablet every other day. <clears throat> and one point, I'm sorry, uh, uh, 0 0.1 uh, of atopica once a day. And like a, a three weeks ago or four weeks ago, we noticed that she wasn't feeling well, that she was again like circling more. Sometimes she seems kind of disorientated and um, uh, and I, I had the feeling like she was losing a vision in her left eye, that she was seeing uh, worse. So we took her to she, her now neurologist. I don't know if we mentioned that she, since she was diagnosed, she already lost vision in the right eye. Okay. They, they, I never the, get vet, back. the vet confirmed it. So mm -hmm. now we thought that maybe it was starting to go worse in the left eye also. Okay. Okay. So we took her to her neurologist and uh, unfortunately her doctor wasn't in the office. So we saw someone else and, uh, and the doctor uh, increased her dose for the first week. She was taking a, a half a tablet twice a day plus atopica, 
and uh, uh, following week until now she's on a half a tablet once a day plus atopica. Also, I'm giving her a few drops of omega-3 twice a day, and she is getting some kind of supplements from her vet because now she developed even a, some kind of skin problem. She was on the antibiotic Clamamox, I think it's called, for a week, and her skin got better. And now, again, she's getting uh, those kind of spots, and I think it's also like uh, how to say pass? pus? Pus, yes. Yeah. It's like it turns pussy and then it, you know, it scabs over. Yeah. So, and also the doctor thinks that she may have a Cushing disease. Mm -hmm. Cushing's disease, yeah. Cushing's disease, oh. yeah. Okay. Um, and, and basically your, your question is, is there anything else we can be doing, a different treatment, et cetera? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We also, um, in the beginning when she first got all the, the steroids and stuff, it was very helpful. Like we saw a big difference. Right. I, we don't know if it's maybe possible that because she's been on them for three years that they're not doing what they used to do for her. Like, yeah. And we, you know. She responded really uh, well yeah. the first time. She, did she go back to pretty much normal outside of being blind in one eye? Like did the, the head tilt and the, the wandering and the circling go away? After yeah. they gave three years her the uh, uh, Kind of, but she never, she never like, uh, 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 you know, regain a vision in her right eye. No, Never. but other than that, she yeah, she she seemed way better. Yes. Okay. And and you're saying this time around with the increase of the the dexamethasone, are are we not seeing any improvement, or are we? There is an improvement, but not that like, not that big like you know the, initially. If maybe if you want, we could show we could put her on the floor and show you how she circles. She goes straight line, but then she stops and she's circling, circling, like, for, okay. for no reason. Okay. And when she means... goes, oh, sorry. Go ahead, she, go ahead. she uses like a wee-wee pad inside the house. So when she has to go to the bathroom and she goes, makes her way to the wee-wee pad, she will, I think, sometimes circle for over a minute before she, like, plants, As she plants her feet sometimes. and, yeah, and, and can go. And it's, it's so, I don't know, it's sometimes it gets crazy. Okay. Dr. Davida, do you have any other, other questions before we? No, I, I think that that's probably has kind of answered most of the questions. Um, you know, so, so in summary, just to summarize for the people watching, you know, we started, at, and to make sure that I understand her complete history, um, we started on the treatment a few years ago, kind of responded really well, so we did kind of one of these and then have kind of gone down and, and up again and kind of done this waxing and waning over time with recently being one of the, the kind of waning portions of her clinical signs, if I, if I understand correctly. Yes, yeah. but this is not her first relapse. I think she had like already a few relapse before. Okay. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And yeah. always was the same procedure, increase the dose of steroids mm -hmm. and then when she was doing better, we, we, again, we decreased. Okay, for sure. So um, specifically for some of our, you know, our, our other viewers who may not be as familiar, GME stands for granulomatous meningoencephalitis. Um, some people will refer to GME with, with many different names. So uh, MUE or, or meningoencephalitis of unknown etiology or meningitis or encephalitis. Um, those are all things that mean relatively the same thing in, you know, in the context of our specific conversation today. Um, so I personally typically use the term meningitis because a lot of people, I think, relate to that and understand it. If you hear me say that, I'm just referring to GME. Um, so in dogs, meningitis is typically an autoimmune disease. They can have an infectious meningitis uh, but it's less common. So an infectious meningitis, like a viral meningitis or a bacterial meningitis, is going to be more common in people. And the way that I like to, um, or, or the thing that I like to compare it to is like a rheumatoid arthritis in people, which is also a disease of the immune system. So basically Maya's immune system and the immune system in other dogs who have GME is going a little bit haywire. The immune system is kind of ramped up and it's inappropriately trying to fight the normal parts of the body. 
Um, and in most immune diseases, that's something that can be controlled, um, but can't often be cured. And that's where, you know, we talk about those things like relapse and, and for our viewers, you know, something that becomes, you know, kind of the long-term goal is to avoid relapse while keeping her disease stable. But oftentimes, unfortunately, the goal isn't curative. Um, so in GME in, in particular, um, the brain is being affected and the cells that lie in the brain are affected as well. Those are called the meninges. Uh, sometimes we can also even see the spinal cord being affected. So all of the parts of the nervous system can be affected in this disease. Um, one of the goals of treatment, of course, is to, to make her clinical signs improve, but also to avoid progression, to involving some of those other parts of the nervous system as well. Um, so in terms of, you know, kind of treatment plan, we have to keep that immune system operating at a little bit lower of a, you know, a, of a, a veracity than it is now and to kind of stop it from inappropriately attacking the normal tissue and, and the normal parts of the body. So that's what your veterinarian is doing with the medications. And those are immunosuppressive medications. We start with steroids because steroids typically work pretty well and typically work pretty quickly, as you've seen with Maya. Um, however, steroids do come with some longer term side effects. So typically we're adding in a different type of immunosuppressive medication and that's where the atopica comes in for Maya. Um, works a little bit differently in the body and sometimes takes longer to start working but will allow us to taper the dose of steroids which will help to avoid some of those long term um, you know, side effects of steroids as kind of started to experience with Maya. Um, so that's the, the general goal for treatment. Um, again, our, our goal is almost never curative because that's not a realistic goal. Our goal is to reach remission, knowing that there's a potential for relapse in any patient with an autoimmune disease, whether they're a human patient, a canine patient, you know, feline patient, any autoimmune disease ha has the chance for relapse. Um, what was I going to say? Prognosis wise, what, what we're usually telling people is, you know, most dogs tend to respond to treatment. Um, some dogs do not. And the way that we split that up is that about 40% of dogs who we treat for meningitis or, or GME um, do respond to therapy and do well. We can taper their doses down to the lowest effective dose and kind of coast from there essentially. So that's a 40% of the dogs. 40% do well, but do a little bit of what Maya's been doing. So they do really, really well, and then they start to backslide, and, and we have to adjust medications and do well and do kind of this waxing and waning, a little bit of a roller coaster um, for her. And, and we do see about 40% <coughs> of patients that have that history and that response to treatment. And then 20% of dogs just never respond the way that we want them to. Um, so obviously Maya wouldn't be in that lower 20%. I'd put her in the middle 40% from what you've described. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but 20% but of dogs, and, and we have to realize that's a, a relatively large percent of dogs that just never respond to treatment the way that we want them to. So it's definitely a, a serious disease and one that, you know, we have to treat um, pretty aggressively. And it, it seems you've done so. Um, when we're talking about you know, the atopica, that's, that's one of the choices for secondary immunosuppressive drugs. Again, with the goal being that we can safely reduce the prednisone and avoid some of those long-term prednisone side effects or dexamethasone, they're both <coughs> steroids. Um, so mm -hmm. you may also hear me say, say prednisone instead, just out of habit. Mm -hmm. um, some of the side effects, you know, of the steroids are things like um, liver enzyme elevation and thinning of the hair coat and weight gain. And, and in the um, short term, they drink more and they eat more and they pee more. Um, so those are definitely things that we want to avoid over time. Now, atopica is one of our choices for a secondary immunosuppressive medication, but there are also other choices for secondary immunosuppressive medications. Um, you know, we have some injectable medications, uh, one of them is called Cytosar. That's an injection that's given. And um, it's actually a chemotherapy drug that modulates the immune system. So it alters the immune system in the way that we want it to, to quiet that immune system down a little bit. There are other oral medications as well. Um, and, and there's quite a variety of them. Um, I think, you know, for us, we're certainly comfortable with certain protocols. And, and we typically use Cytosar and Atopica as our 
you know, choices A and B of immunosuppressive drugs. There are other neurologists who use, you know, choices, other choices, C, D, and E, essentially. Um, some of those you may hear are, are things like azathioprine or leflunamide. Um, those are other immunosuppressive medications. And again, the, the, the goal of all those medications is to do the same thing. Um, so to suppress and quiet down the immune system. They all work a little bit differently. They all come with their own kind of set of side effects and a set of pros and cons, essentially, requirements for blood work monitoring. Um, but those are the other options. And there are some dogs that do require multiple immunosuppressives, more than two, to control the disease. Um, so again, for our viewers, that's kind of a, a very brief summary of all of those options. Um, but that's you know, what we typically be talking to um, our patients who are diagnosed with, with meningitis. That's what we'd be talking to them about is, okay, you know, there's options A, B, C, D, E. We typically recommend options A, B, C. Um, what works within your, you know, your budget does play a part in some of it for your dog specifically, obviously, you know, looking at the whole picture. Logistically, some people aren't able to get into the hospital for injections of medication. Um, so that's a very uh, case dependent decision that we make both based on the patient status and the client status and client input. Um, but, you know, there, there are certainly other options for immunosuppressive medications. And sometimes dogs do require adjustments over time or addition of other medications. And it, it may be that Maya is one of those dogs that would benefit from a, you know, a little bit of a, another medication or a, an adjustment and, and staying potentially at higher doses and things like that. Um, so yeah. I think initially Dr. Wong caveated with it's, it's hard for us to make those recommendations without meeting Maya and examining her and looking over her records. Um, but, you know, you may be able next time you see your neurologist who knows her best um, to talk about, you know, what are some of the other options or, you know, what are some other drugs we could add or other things that we could try to try and, you know, prolong her next relapse if it's going to happen or prevent it in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, for me, uh, inflammatory brain disease or meningitis or GME, um, you know, the, the, the treatment, there, there isn't sort of one, you know, protocol that works for all dogs. Um, just every dog's different. Every neurologist is different. So there isn't one agreed upon, you know, if this happens, then do that. If that happens, then do this. Um, but for me, whenever a pet is showing signs of, of a relapse, <clears throat> I guess I have to first ask, is it a, a relapse or something new? In, in Maya's case, it sounds more like these are relapses. You know, it'd be one thing if you told me six years ago she had this, she got 100% better, and three weeks ago this started again. I'd have to ask, well, gosh, is this a new problem? But it sounds like over the last three years we've had, you know, symptoms. Mm -hmm. back. So it, it's likely um, relapses or recurrence or, or all a continuum of the same, same condition. Um, from there, it's, it's I, I guess a lot of times for me, you know, art, art versus science of, of treatment. And a lot of times it's, are we just increasing doses versus are we adding in new medications? Um, and, and there, again, isn't one particular recommendation that we always give. But um, th this would be something where I would be asking the question, you know, is there a medication other than dexamethasone and, um, and atopica that might work, and, and that's what your neurologist can talk with you about, of you know, what's kind of their medication C or medication D, um, and what works best for, like, like Dr. DeVita alluded to, you know, your, your schedule with going into the hospital um, with her particular medical conditions, you know, blood work, other things going on, et cetera, to, to make that decision. Um, but there are other medications that, you know, can be uh, it, it sounds like in Maya's case, it's usually added as opposed to, you know, I'm going to switch this one for that one. It's usually when it's something like this, we're kind of trying to add another medication. Um, some dogs, yeah, we add that third medication and things get get better. Many dogs, you know, wh whether, whether I were to start with medication A, B, and C, or whether I had started with medication A, D, and E, um, as an example, uh, many times it, it, dogs that are going to respond to one medication, you know, are probably going to respond to the other medication. There isn't really anything that says this is better than that. A lot of it is just 
the, the training of the individual neurologist and what they're used to, what's worked for them um, in the past. So uh, I guess the takeaway is there, there isn't one right thing to do that, um, you know, that, that we can make that recommendation from here that I think that anyone could. Mm -hmm. But I would, I would mm -hmm. continue the conversation with your neurologist. You know, are, are there other medications that we should be um, adding? In, in theory, are there other things other than it just being a relapse that we should be considering? I personally think that's less likely, but you know, needs to be in our thought process. Mm -hmm. um, the last time we did bring her to the vet, they did uh, suggest chemotherapy. Infusion, some, yes. Or that, that was, I think, called chemotherapy infusions, some kind of uh, shots, right? That's probably the side of R. Mm -hmm. And my question is because Ma uh, Maya's lab work, it's not so good lately. Okay. Do you think that this, this chemotherapy mm -hmm. may harm her or uh, it, will, it, it, will be, it will be safe? It will be safe for her. I, th I think that's a question I, I would hesitate to answer without, you know, being able to see the blood work. Mm -hmm. The chemotherapy that we use is generally relatively well tolerated. Um, but again, I, I hesitate to, to make that distinct recommendation mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. seeing that blood work. Um, mm -hmm. you know, but, but obviously, I, I think her veterinarian would probably be able to make that judgment call. And, and realistically, in medicine, everything's a, a judgment call of what is the risk of this? What is the mm -hmm. reward? And does the reward outweigh the risk? Um, mm -hmm. So I think they're, they're good people to make that decision. Um, and I would have that conversation and, you know, you can, can pose it in that manner is, do you think this will be beneficial enough to be worth whatever amount of risk there is? Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's a really important thing to consider. I wouldn't let blood work changes deter you from doing it altogether. I just think it's something that that should be chatted about before you and, and your veterinary team make that ultimate decision um, of what to do next. I understand. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Got it. It's our pleasure. Uh, thanks thank for letting you. us meet Maya. It, it is, it's a, it's a tough disease and it sounds like you're doing uh, everything possible for her. Keep, you're asking all the right questions. Um, I, I just think the, the neurologist in Long Island is going to be so much better equipped, you know, being able to see her, look at the blood work to make a strong recommendation. But those are all the questions that I'd want you to be asking me, you know, here. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure your neurologist, you know, is happy to answer those questions. Yeah, thank you guys thank so you. much for your time and all your help. You're very welcome. Thank you. Take care. Have a good day. Have a good day. Thank, thank you. Thanks. Bye. Just while, while while you're connecting, I'm just going to go ahead and 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 read the um, read, read what you said sent here. Uh, you have a an eight week old Bernadoodle um, that you guys got in July named Murphy. Oh, there you are. Hi. Hi. Hi sorry, you? I was calling in. <laughs> no problem. So I, I'm Dr. Wong. This is Dr. Davida. Um, Hi. T t tell us about Murphy. Yeah, so he, I would show you, but he's sleeping right now. So we take precious nap time around here since he's still a puppy. <laughs> I don't want to try and wake him. Um, so my husband and I just got him in the beginning of July. Um, he, we got him at eight weeks. He's a Bernadoodle, um, standard poodle, Bernadoodle mom. So, you know, he's going to probably be a very big boy <laughs> um, moving forward. He's already, I'd say, a little over four months right now and he's roughly 30 pounds. And, um, you know, he's been extremely well-tempered and just, you know, standard puppy with all the, you know, fun things that come along with puppy training. And um, about a couple weeks after we, we had him, we noticed um, that he, he did something, he was, looked like he was almost throwing, throwing up or um, we weren't really sure. It was like very quick, but it was like kind of foamy at the mouth. And so we didn't really know what that, what that meant. We thought he had kind of destroyed this like nylo bone that we gave him. So we thought maybe his stomach was upset from ingesting something like that. Um, but then another week or so went by and he started having more severe um, seizures, which at the time we didn't know, but we, we brought him to our vet and showed, 
show them a video who said, yes, he's that that's a seizure and he's been having them. So our, our local vet immediately put him on um, phenobarbital. So he was on 15 milligrams twice a day that we were giving him and she recommended um, a, a neurologist in the area where I'm in New Jersey. So um, she recommended a, a vet specialist in the event that anything else happened. Um, and then so it was later that evening, I believe he had his first cluster um, seizure. So he had about four um, over like a six hour period. They were lasting anywhere from like one to two minutes. He would, you know, jerk around, foam at the mouth, uh, defecated, you know, peed in, the, peed in the room and everything. And then it would take him a couple minutes to kind of get back to normal. He would be very disoriented. So we rushed him over to the specialist and he's been seeing that neurologist on and off um, since then. So um, he was basically on the taking 30 milligrams of phenobarbital for a month. Um, so the last seizures that he had had prior to that were the very end of July. And during the month of August, he was completely fine. So he went to the regular vet. He got more of his puppy shots and vaccines. We had given him um, Interceptor for heartworm and NexGuard for flea and tick, um, both uh, oral supplements, and he did fine on that. And then um, recently, in the beginning of this month, when we had to give him new medication, we gave him Brevecto and Interceptor again, and he started having cluster seizures again. And we brought him back to our neurologist who said his dosage of pheno should be upped to 30 twice a day. So we did that. And then they did a blood test recently to just see if he was in the therapeutic level, and he wasn't. So he was still very low, even on the 30 milligrams that he had been on for about two to three weeks. And so now, as of only a couple of days ago, he's now on 60 milligrams twice a day. So we're going to have to go back and get blood work done. Um, but basically, when this all first started and we brought him to the neurologist, they did all the tests. They, they did the regular neurology exam. Um, they, they checked him for like a liver shunt, kidney issues, blood work, bile tests infectious disease and everything came back negative. So they told us essentially, you know, next step would be either an MRI and or a spinal tap to determine anything further. So they haven't really diagnosed him with epilepsy or anything at this point. They said it's probably the cause, but um, you know, seeing as it's only been a, a couple months since we've had him and, you know, he's very young, we, we just aren't sure, I guess, and that's kind of what I wanted to ask your a, a second opinion for you guys. Have you seen this in, you know, what's your experience been with puppies this young experiencing something like this? And do you recommend that an MRI would be a good next option for us to see and check off anything else? If there is anything, you know, wrong from the MRI and, you know, we kind of are just all over the place with trying to figure out, you know, what, what the best course for him is. And we want to know that if we can continue with medication, once we get his levels all correct, that he'll be able to, you know, still live a, a norm, semi-normal life. So, I mean, seizures are one of the most common neurological conditions that we see. Um, right. And I'm sure you, you've been told all of this, but a, a seizure is an abnormal burst of electrical activity in the front part of the mm -hmm. brain. So normally the brain has electrical activity, but what a seizure is, is when there's too much happening all at the same time. And what we see on the outside is, is just what you've described. I mean, sometimes it can just be the mouth. Sometimes it can be the whole body where we lose consciousness, yeah. we fall on our side, our legs may paddle, they might go out stiff. It can look mm -hmm. like we're choking, um, many dogs yeah. salivate, many dogs poop, many dogs pee. It can last mm -hmm. anywhere from a few seconds to a, a few minutes, and then they kind of go back to, you know, it, it goes away just Normal. as quickly as it can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I, I like to think of causes of seizures as three main things, and this will kind of get to um, the rationale for doing tests right. versus not doing tests. Uh, um, I think of them as things outside of the brain, like 
low blood sugar and toxins mm -hmm. and liver shunts. And those are all things that we test for with blood tests. So they're kind of all the things that you've looked at already. It sounds like you've done a, a bile acids to look for a liver shunt. You've done yep. general mm -hmm. blood work to look for low blood sugar yeah. and kidney disease and electrolyte mm -hmm. disturbances. So yeah. the second broad category of causes of seizures is something physically wrong inside of the brain. So some people might call it um, structural or some people might call it intracranial. It all just means something physically wrong inside of the brain. And mm -hmm. examples of those are things like brain tumors and strokes. You know, when we have a dog this young, we think of things like congenital malformations in the brain, like a, a cyst right. or hydrocephalus, or just mm -hmm. um, the, the brain not forming correctly. Um, we think of things like infections in the brain. Um, we, and then the, the third main cause of seizures is what we call epilepsy or idiopathic epilepsy. And that just means recurrent seizures that we don't find a problem outside of the brain to explain it or a problem physically mm -hmm. inside of the brain to explain it. Usually those dogs with epilepsy, um, there are a couple generalizations we can make about those dogs. Usually they're between one and five years of age when they have their first seizure. Y yes, mm -hmm. we can see them a little bit earlier. You know, some people will say six months, I, I guess kind of getting into, um, you know, nine weeks of, of age is, is in my opinion, pretty young for epilepsy, not right. impossible. Um, we'll, we'll see some dogs with puppy epilepsy, um, that, that they'll have seizures as a, as a puppy and then they seem to grow out of it. Um, mm -hmm. But it just, so things that we expect with epilepsy, usually between one and five years of age, usually have a normal exam. That's something that I can't see here, but your neurologist I'm sure has done, you know, multiple neurological right. examinations. Usually they're completely normal between seizures. Um, I know we didn't mm -hmm. talk about it here, but I'm sure it's something your neurologist has asked you about of, well, how does he act in between the seizures? Is he running around right. like a maniac, chasing the ball, playing, acting like a normal mm -hmm. puppy? Um, and then the, the fourth generalization is it's usually kind of that whole body seizure, what we call a generalized clonic tonic seizure. So many of those things fit, um, fit with him, but just the age is one of those things that makes me worried. Well, all the pieces don't fit with idiopathic epilepsy which just mm -hmm. raises the suspicion for, is there something physically wrong inside of the brain, which raises the recommendation of doing an MRI or, or the, so the rationale, your neurologist, and I, I guess for, for all neurologists out there and for all um, you know, pet owners, we, we don't like to do MRIs simply, you know, simply to do them. We're doing them to, to, to answer right. a question so that we can better and more specifically for your pet say, what's the what's the cause and by knowing what the cause is i can better coach you on the best treatment and what it means for him in the long term so um for me there are a couple reasons where i say yes your dog is a candidate for an mri or it's time to do something more um <clears throat> one is if we have already looked um, at blood work and um, we've already looked at blood work and seizures are continuing at a relatively unacceptable or, or high frequency or high severity. Um, two is when the clinical picture doesn't really fit for idiopathic epilepsy, meaning if we're nine, nine weeks old when we start having seizures or we're 12 years old when we start having seizures or eight years old when we start having seizures, or if we're not normal between seizures, you know, we're walking in circles or we're bumping into things. Um, so those are reasons to consider an MRI. And then just for me, um, I, I guess the, 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 not the last thing, but one of the other things I'm considering and making a recommendation, well, gosh, what would I be doing if, if this were my pet? And mm -hmm. I, I think there's a strong rationale for considering an MRI. Yes, there are downsides of doing MRIs. The two main ones that we talk about here are basically we recognize that they're expensive tests and you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're just expensive tests because it's expensive machinery and it's um, expensive for the upkeep of the machines and expense for the anesthesia and the expertise that goes into 
doing safe anesthesia and reading MRIs. Um, and then the other downside that we talk about is just the, 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 the risk of anesthesia. Um, so that's something that I'm, you know, your neurologist would be able to be better assess him and say, yes, I think he's a good anesthetic candidate. Um, and I'm sure they've kind of talked to you about what, what it costs. Um, so with regards to, um, you know, the medications, you know, when, when we've got a, a young dog that's growing rapidly, um, right. because we yeah. base our dose, one of the things we base the dose off of is what does the pet weigh? You know, sometimes we start off at a, at a reasonable dose, but our growth outpaces you know, the amount of medication we're giving. So we kind of take multiple things into account. We take into account, well, what's the seizure control? You know, if 30 milligrams twice a day was cutting it for him, you know, we'd be less inclined to be increasing it. Um, it sounds like we've continued to have seizures. And then one of the other things that we look for in the decision for what are we doing with the medications is what are the serum levels? If the serum levels are low, and we've got poor control, yeah, the rationale should be, we, we increase it. You know, at a, at a 40 pound dog, yeah, 60 milligrams twice a day would, you know, kind of be a, a, a starting dose for me. Um, mm -hmm. you, you may even end up when, when you do the levels, end up being kind of at the low end of where we wanna be, but that will be something that we'll, we'll look at. Uh, how is he tolerating the medications uh, with regards to side effects? How is he, uh, responding to them with regards to seizure control. Um, so with regards to your, your, your questions, um, you know, do we recommend the, the MRI? I guess it's tough for me to recommend the MRI, but I think there's plenty of, of rationale uh, to be doing it. And from what I'm hearing, and again, your neurologist can answer it best, but you know, we, we sort of look at the pros and cons. What's the likelihood of us helping What's the likelihood of this test helping our ability to answer the question and help this pet versus what are the downsides? And, you know, in, in, in this mm -hmm. case, it sounds like there's a lot tipping the scale towards yes for an MRI. Um, have we seen a puppy this young have seizures um, and would epilepsy be, be a main cause? I guess to me, when I see a young dog with seizures, you know, we, we have to consider things like toxins. They're just more likely to get into things they're not supposed to. But the fact that this has been recurrent makes it less likely unless he keeps getting into the same toxin. Um, the, the next thing that I think of is infectious causes. Just puppies are more likely to get uh, brain infections that could lead to seizures. Many times those dogs will have abnormalities on their exam. Um, you know, they're walking in circles, they're blind, et cetera, but can't rule it out just based off of that. So that's where MRI and spinal tap um, and sometimes blood tests for infectious diseases come in. Um, the next thing that I think of would be some sort of congenital malformation, like we talked about, that would be something that we can really only see on an MRI. Again, another uh, vote on the pile towards, towards an MRI. And, uh, and then metabolic things, low blood sugar, uh, liver problems, et cetera. So things that you've, you've looked for already. Um, occasionally we will see a puppy that has seizures, they're legitimate seizures. And um, th this is one of the few times that sometimes we treat it and the seizures go away. So most of the time for seizures, what we're preparing owners for is once your dog has seizures, they're they're always at risk for seizures. Uh, treatment is lifelong. Mm -hmm. Our goal is to decrease frequency, severity, and duration of seizures, but we don't realistically expect to stop all seizures. Occasionally, I've had a puppy that, you know, we, we diagnose, um, you know, no, blood work's normal, liver shunt is ruled out, MRI is normal, spinal tap's normal, and occasionally I've had that puppy that that's the scenario, and they, for lack of a better term, grow out of it and, and don't have seizures right. you know, later on in life. Best case scenario, that, that's, that's what I'd be hoping for. Um, and then you say, you know, the medications for life, uh, medication can help, that's great. Nervous that he's so young. Um, 
So the, the question is, what's the life expectancy? Uh, to me, that depends, one, on the underlying cause. So if we had, mm -hmm. for example, a pediatric brain tumor or we had a brain infection, yes, that would be something that would decrease the, the life expectancy. Whereas if this is, is, is epilepsy or if we don't find an underlying cause, um, there is a study out there that suggests that dogs with epilepsy don't live as long as dogs, make sure I'm saying it right, dogs with epilepsy don't live as long as dogs with epilepsy. Um, the, uh, the, the challenge with that study is it, it you know, takes, doesn't take, it does factor in sort of the economic and the, uh, the, the parental decisions as opposed to do the seizures actually shorten the life or do the medications um, shorten the life or is it just because dogs that are continuing to have seizures and those owners are having to go to the emergency clinic every three weeks and they're spending thousands right. of dollars um, or is the quality of life deemed not appropriate? Is that what causes the lifespan to be shorter as opposed to are the seizures or the underlying disease process actually shortening the lifespan? So, um, so a, a shorter answer of that is study says yes, mm -hmm. but there's a little asterisk next to, to it in my mind of, you know, factors that. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. We, we figured that an MRI is probably the, the next best step, but, um, you know, it's always good to get a second, a second opinion and, and find out more because, um, you know, when everything was happening and that's when we did all the original tests and the neuro neurologist was like, these are the next steps. Should you want to go that route? Um, we know we spoke with our local vet too, who said, you know, if he's doing well on the medication and, and you can be seizure free for until he's at least closer to one year old, maybe because he's still growing you know, you can look at it then. So that's kind of what we were hopeful for. But unfortunately, you know, he was only about 30 days seizure-free until a couple weeks yeah. ago. And, and that's a very reasonable approach to take back then. And, mm -hmm. and it's, it's not even unreasonable now, you know. It's yeah. Not, not every dog that has a seizure, um, you know, gets an MRI or even needs an MRI. And that's why we mm -hmm. take it on an individual basis. You know, if, if, if you gave me the same, scenario that, that, that he was a four-year-old lab that had had a seizure once every four months for the last three years, you know, my approach would be very different. Yes, he has seizures, but it, mm -hmm. it really fits with idiopathic epilepsy and the seizure frequency seems to be relatively drawn out, you know, four months in between. So it's very much an individual, um, individual factors that we, that we take into account. So I don't want you to walk away from this, you know, hearing that I, I need to do an MRI or that it's wrong right. if I don't. Um, it's, it's completely reasonable to try medications to treat the seizures and hope that it, um, it works. And many times, you know, in theory, we could do the MRI and the treatment is going to be, here, here's your 16. The same exact, yeah. Exactly. Right. Um, and, and for me, a lot of that is coaching the owner that that's a, a, a potential scenario, but two, um, framing it in the, that's what we want to find, that, that, that we're on the right track, you know, because finding a brain infection or a malformation or a pediatric brain tumor or, you know, a degenerative process, any of those other things are all going to be worse than not finding anything at all. And it also just lets us know we're doing everything that we can. We've, we've, we've kicked mm -hmm. over every stone. We've, we've answered all the possible questions and we know that we're on the right treatment track, so. Yeah, that makes sense. That's, uh, that's kind of where our, where our minds were going to, but we you know, weren't sure and sometimes. The, I guess the question I have too in regards to that is with the MRI, do they, you know, is it, just dependent on the results that you would then get a spinal tap after that or do they really go hand in hand should you really be doing both maybe not at the same exact time but do the mri and then see if the spinal tap either reaffirms what they found in an mri or what wasn't found in an mri, MRI. So, so our, our approach here with um spinal taps and tests in general is we 
We try and only do the tests that are medically necessary. Um, and mm -hmm. we try and do them in the most appropriate, le least invasive, least expensive things first, and then move towards the more expensive, more invasive sure. things last. Um, in general, for me at least, there aren't a lot of scenarios where a spinal tap by itself is going to give me a lot of information. So I, I still get that question a fair amount of, well, gosh, could we do the spinal tap first or can't you just do a spinal mm -hmm. tap and rule out, rule out meningitis and then we'll worry about an MRI later. And my approach with that is they both require anesthesia. So I'm taking on a lot of the same risks. Um, yes, the MRI is more expensive than, than the spinal tap, but it's not insignificant, the spinal tap cost. Mm -hmm. To me, the main reasons of um, the reason I do the MRI first is one, it gives me a picture of the brain. So if I were to see an obvious answer, let's say I were to see um, a brain tumor, you know, many times the, the spinal tap isn't going to give me a lot more information that changes my recommendation. The other reason is the MRI uh, sometimes tells me that the spinal tap might have a higher risk and that I shouldn't be doing it. So um, in that same example, if I saw a large brain tumor, that is sometimes a, a riskier spinal tap to do. And it says, well, gosh, the, the risk reward has gone from here to, to here. We're not doing it. Um, we also do it under the same anesthetic period. So here we have the availability and, and, and most, most neurology offices have the ability to do the MRI, read the MRI and under the same an anesthetic period, do the spinal tap right afterwards, kind of as that pet is waking up. So it becomes one anesthetic period and um, we've, we've made sure one, that we need to do the spinal tap, that we don't already have the answer without it, and two, that it's as safe of a procedure as possible. Okay, that makes sense. Well, you answered all my questions. <laughs> so. I really appreciate your time and, and helping answer some of these questions. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad I found, found you guys through a Facebook group and it's always reassuring, at least for, for us as a pet owner to, to get that, you know, second generalized opinion and, you know, just make sure that we're doing the right things for him and, you know, as much as we can do and that, you know, we're not putting him more at risk for either not doing something or, you know, being wrong for wanting to see how the medication, and especially because he's so young and we just switched his levels, like seeing, you know, how he does on the higher dose now, since he's been growing a little bit more, you know, we were thinking we can wait that, wait that out a little bit until his next blood test to test for the therapeutic levels and, and see how it is. Cause it's been very consistent too with him where all of his seizures happen while he's just, like, well, at night when he's, when he's sleeping. So um, that's been, you know, at least pretty consistent. And the only thing that I guess you can hope for with, in regards to a dog having seizures is that they're pretty consistent in terms of when we can expect them from him in the middle of the night and, and how long that they've been. So there hasn't been anything too abnormal about that. And from every time that he's had them and the fact that he, he really is ex oddly normal after everything. <laughs> like, you know, un unfortunately the phenobarbital doesn't affect him in the, in the sleepiness side of it so far as a puppy. So we're still, uh, <laughs> he's still very much a puppy, which I guess is a very good thing for us. So, you know, we're, we're hopeful for him. So I appreciate your time. You got it. Thank you. Take care. Have a good day. Thank you. You too. You too. Bye. Hi, what do you guys recommend for a one-year-old American bully who's had two seizures of less than 30 seconds in his lifetime, which owner suspects was because of trifexis for heartworm and flea preventative that we gave him as a puppy. We've been hesitant to put him on preventative um, ever since mosquito season is, excuse me, ever since, but mosquito season is crazy right now. He hasn't had any seizures, I'm assuming since June, which is great. And we're hoping he doesn't get them again. My question is if there's anything you recommend, specific brand or maybe something natural. So, so the fact that we've only had um, two seizures less than 30 seconds. Um, so in general, same thing like we just talked about with, um, with, with, with the, uh, the, the Bernadoodle. 
causes of seizures, things outside of the brain, things inside of the brain, idiopathic epilepsy. Um, so we don't know that the cause right now is because of any of these medications. Um, it sounds like they're relatively brief, brief, sounds like they're relatively infrequent. So with regards to necessarily treating them with phenobarbital or Keppra or anything like that, um, you could argue it either way. In, since we've had two seizures, we kind of have a baseline. It's not wrong to start medications, um, but it sounds like they're relatively infrequent and relatively short. The next step from there for me would be trying to figure out the cause. Um, yes, I can get the idea of not necessarily wanting to get into things like MRIs and spinal taps, but I think at least an evaluation with your veterinarian um, and or a neurologist and general blood work, CBC chemistry, electrolytes to uh, try and rule out or make less likely things outside of the brain, again, toxins, low blood sugar, liver shunts, et cetera, as the cause. So um, with regards to heartworm medication, heartworm and flea medication causing seizures. Um, there are ones that we um, legitimately know that they are, are linked to seizures. So I, I won't say they necessarily cause seizures, but they're linked to seizures. So whether um, it's actually causing the seizure or whether your pet or pets that have seizures after starting these medications, whether those pets are just already um, more prone to seizures, and it just lowers that seizure threshold just a bit enough for that seizure to happen. Um, so the, the, the trifexis is, trifexis is? Trifexis is one of the ones that, um, you know, is, is well documented that uh, we prefer not to be giving to dogs with known seizures, or if you've given it and a dog had a seizure, you know, right after getting it, let's avoid it. Um, the other ones that I, 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 I consider a little bit higher risk are the, the Brevectos and the Nexgards. Um, kind of in the middle are the ones that in theory there is um, a, a basis for them doing the same thing, making seizures more likely in a pet or causing seizures. Um, the things like the ivermectins, the, the heart guards, stuff like that, in theory, can lower seizure threshold. Um, they're just, they're such tiny low doses that we give. I mean, you could, you could very much overdose. You could give much more than you're giving um, for a heartworm preventative type dose, and it'd still be very, very safe for most dogs. There are certain breeds that have a gene mutation that they cannot get ivermectin. Um, and then there are the ones that I consider, you know, to be the, 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 the safer ones. Um, the interceptors, the sentinels, things like that. Uh, the, I'm, I'm just more comfortable with those. From a flea standpoint, most of the topicals, the, the advantages, the front lines, the Advantix, the Advantage Multi, um, those are ones that have a, you know, very, very high margin of safety and very, very low likelihood of of causing or exacerbating seizures. So, um, so are there other medications that you can, let's talk about one, one other thing, um, not wanting to have them on any preventative, um, being that it's mosquito season. So uh, um, I don't know wh where you live, but if you're anywhere in the United States, there are mosquitoes and there are, um, there are heartworms. So we, just like the, the last two or three things we've talked about, we kind of, um, weigh the pros and cons, the risk, you know, versus benefits, and um, just the likelihood of your dog getting heartworm disease if they're not on a preventative is, is quite high. So um, dogs should definitely be tested before starting any sort of preventative. So go to your veterinarian, have this conversation. Um, they'll know better than I will about, you know, um, when to test being based on how long your, your dog's been off medications, um, but testing to make sure that we are not heartworm positive. If we're not heartworm positive, starting a preventative. Um, and there are ones other than you know, the trifexis uh, that are very, very safe. Heart guard, interceptor, sentinel should all be fine. Advantage multi, revolution. I'll admit that, that is, is, is not my strong suit of all of the uh, 
um, the preventatives that are out there, there are probably newer ones, um, you know, since, since last time we talked about this three weeks ago that, that have come out. Um, so I, I don't have all of them on the top of my head, but those are the common ones and uh, kind of our approach. All righty. So uh, Teresa says, my dog Kona has IVDD type one herniated disc six years ago. I keep him on acupuncture and cold laser therapy every month. Can type one turn into type two as they get older? He's 10 now and he's starting to show signs of cervical uh, disc disease. So presumably, and, and I'm, I'm pretty confident that we've talked in the past that, um, that, that uh, Kona had a, a TL, a, a mid-back disc okay. problem in the past. Um, I, I'm not 100% sure of that, but Dr. DeVita, if you wanna, yeah. wanna take it and assume that Kona had TL type one, um, is now showing cervical signs and then kind of talk yeah. type one versus type two and all that. Yeah. So um, just to kind of, kind of review disc disease in dogs in general. Um, so uh, again, might be using different terminology, but IVDD um, or disc disease or a ruptured disc or slip disc or disc herniation. Those are all kind of words for essentially the same thing. Um, so in general, uh, the discs lie between the bones of the spine and they act like shock absorbers, um, you know, to, to absorb the shock on the spine when a dog twists and turns and runs and does all, the, all of the things that a dog should enjoy doing. Uh, when we have a, a slipped disc or, or IVDD, the disc essentially gets weaker over time and um, as the forces on the disc change and the health of the disc changes over time, they kind of um, you know, react to those things in different ways. And I like to always um, describe it to people as a jelly donut because it's often the thing that people can relate to most. So a disc is made up of a jelly-like center. Are you laughing because we have jelly donuts in here like every day? Or I'm just laughing because I relate everything to food. So go, go on, <laughs> do not let me... No. Um, so the disc is composed of a jelly-like center. Obviously that's the jelly of the donut and then a fibrous capsule on the outside and that's the cake part of the donut. Um, and that fibrous capsule, um, you know, kind of keeps the jelly where it's supposed to be in a healthy, normal intervertebral disc. Over time, a few things can happen. So in type one disc disease, that um, jelly center kind of starts to, to get older and weaker and fills in with a, a rougher material that's similar to, to calcium. Um, and, and some dogs are bred, um, you know, in a way that kind of we breed them to have these short, stubby, cute legs and the longer backs. And those dogs typically have discs that undergo that change a little bit earlier in life. Um, but as that disc starts to fill in with tougher material, um, it'll do a few things. And, and number one, it can absorb those forces, the natural forces um, of a dog moving as well as it was when it was jelly. Um, and it can also start to kind of rub away and make that fibrous donut-like portion weaker. So in type one disc herniation, the, the capsule, the donut part, will essentially have a hole in it. That's where we kind of get the term rupture. And that jelly-like center, whether it's still jelly or whether it's filled in with a tougher material, is allowed to slip out and put pressure on the spinal cord because of that, that hole. Um, so if, if this is spinal cord, disc sits underneath and um, can kind of push up and press on spinal cord. Um, so type one disc herniations typically happen relatively quickly. Um, we can see them in younger dogs and we're usually seeing them in our kind of shorter leg, longer backed breeds like dachshunds and shizus and French bulldogs. And um, so kind of our typical poster children for disc herniation. In, so, and another word, um, just to kind of add more, more, more words to the fire, um, another word we might use for that is an extrusion. So the disc material or the jelly part has extruded from the donut and is now outside of the donut pressing on the spinal cord essentially. Um, in type two disc disease, that's more of a kind of chronic change um, where that, that donut, that jelly-like capsule, um, because of some of the forces put on it over time, starts to get kind of thicker um, and, and eventually will we'll build up and get thicker and thicker and protrude into the spinal canal. And that's where it starts to press on the spinal cord. Um, those dogs are typically older when we see them presenting for, for disc disease. And 
Uh, large breed dogs are, are more of what we think of, although both large breed dogs and small breed dogs can have either type of disc herniation. Um, so yes, there are poster children for each type, um, but you know, they can cross, cross boundaries essentially. Um, so the, the question was, you know, can type one turn into type two? Um, and I, I guess I would not think of that occurring. Um, you know, I think the, the main question here is, you know, he's starting to, to show signs in his neck. And one of the things to remember is, you know, that um, dogs have lots of discs in their neck and their back. And even a dog that's had surgery, yes, we fix that disc. And sometimes we even do prophylactic procedures to minimize the risk of, of having disc herniations in the future. But we can can never make that risk zero for any dog. Um, so a dog that had a back problem previously can have a neck problem in the future, unfortunately. Um, and it's because of those, you know, those same types of changes within the disc and those same types of forces that are being put on that disc that again acts like a shock absorber. Um, so I guess I've never seen like a disc, a dog that had a disc extrusion um, and then had, you know, kind of thickening of of the donut portion, the fibrous portion called the annulus. Um, I don't, I don't know if you have, but I don't know that we would that we would appreciate that aside yeah, from doing repeat MRIs over time. Exactly, it, it, it would be it would be tough to prove. Um, I, I guess in theory, in the same disc, could you have both processes happening or happen at different times in the life? Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I think that's kind of the the theoretical question. I think the more clinical question, you know. Of, of what's going on with Kona, um, it, it sounds like it's a new problem since we're so, showing signs of a neck pain or a problem in the neck as opposed to a problem in the back. It's most likely a, a, a new disc, but it could be something else being that, um, if I remember correctly, we're 10 now and it was six years ago. Um, so other things that we see that can cause problems in the neck, um, things like slip discs, things like tumors, uh, things like uh, stenosis or wobbler syndrome, uh, things like discospondylitis infections. Uh, I don't know if I already said myelitis, meningitis. Um, so, so yes, it could be another disc. It could be a, a type two disc versus a, a Hansen type one, um, but it could be a bunch of other things. So um, a couple more. Um, Charlotte says, can you advise if myelomalacia is always fatal or if it clots before it ascends too far, uh, can the dog survive? Myelomalacia is a, a potential sequela to severe spinal cord injury. Um, we're, we're talking about it most often here when we have dogs who have a, a severe spinal cord problem causing them to be unable to move their legs and feel their toes. Um, so. I'm sure we've talked previously on the, the Q and A's about our grading system for dogs with spinal cord injury being graded on a scale of one to five with a grade one being the least severely affected category of dogs with, with only pain and a grade five being the most severely affected category uh, with an inability to move the legs and an inability to feel the toes. So when we have a dog that comes into us with a, a grade five spinal cord problem, and typically we're seeing those being slip discs causing those problems, um, we do bring up myelomalacia as a, a potential complication. Um, it occurs in about 10 to 15% of dogs that have a, a grade five spinal cord injury, and um, those numbers can kind of vary based on the study. Um, so what happens is, is myelomalacia translates to um, uh, death of, of the, or softening of the spinal cord. And, and this complication, you know, kind of causes the normal parts of the spinal cord to become affected um, because of both vascular injury and kind of inflammatory products in the body um, that are, are unable to be controlled by the body. And I guess I haven't found a better way to describe it. And maybe you have a better way to describe it um, without getting too too scientific, but but that's typically. What I actually go the other direction where I, I call it a, a chain reaction of okay. um, kind of the, the spinal cord dies here and moves yeah. up, moves down that works. chain reaction. So it, it goes up the spinal cord and down the spinal cord. I don't know if you had talked about sort of the ascending and descending. Yeah, part. so that's that's where I was going next. Is that 
you know, that, that chain reaction essentially starts to affect um, the spinal cord both behind the injury closer to the back legs and the tail. Um, and some of the things that we see when, when that happens is that a dog will lose their reflex and lose their ability to control defecation. So reflexes in the back legs being, you know, the knee jerk reflex, just like they test in children um, at the pediatrician. And um, so losing those abilities, but other, you know, kind of further in progression of the disease, um, it will move forward in the spinal cord more towards the front legs. And when that happens, we see weakness of the front legs. Um, we test what's, what's called the cutaneous trunk eye or skin twitch reflex that kind of will move more forward um, as, as myelomalacia progresses. And eventually myelomalacia will affect um, the diaphragm, which is the muscle that controls our breathing and dog's breathing. And when that happens, it does unfortunately become fatal. Um, and we're typically recommending euthanasia when we see evidence of ascending myelomalacia starting to affect the front legs and before it starts to affect the breathing. Um, because it, in that event, it's, um, in my opinion, at least the most humane thing to do um, so that we don't have a dog that has to have difficulty breathing because it will become fatal over time. Um, myelomalacia is really hard to predict. Um, certainly there are things we can look for on our imaging, on our MRI to say, okay, you know, does this dog have a, a potential for myelomalacia? Um, but realistically, the only way to definitively diagnose it is, um, is to examine the, the affected spinal cord, um, which, which we can't do um, while, while our dogs are still with us. So that would be something that we'd find on a, a necropsy or, or a dog op autopsy. Um, so I've never seen myelomalacia stop. Um, I have only seen cases where it does progress both down and up the spinal cord to affect the front legs. And um, I've seen one case that euthanasia was not elected by the owner and actually started to affect the brain as well. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen it stop. I think you've told me maybe about one case potentially. Yeah. So I guess the, the other things that I'll, I'll add in about um, <clears throat> about myelomalacia that I, I'm not sure that, that, that I heard you say, it can start anywhere within like the first week of the injury. So from the time that dog slips its disc, because it's usually because of a slip disc, um, it can happen anywhere within the first week. I, I, I was taught kind of anywhere in the first four or five days, and then I had a dog where it happened on day five. So I changed my, my, my speech, and then a dog where it happened on day six, and the dog where it happened on day seven. So it's this really stinky situation where when we're presented with a dog that's category five, again, the paraplegic no deep pain, that its best chances of walking um, and, and surviving are if we do that MRI and surgery as soon as possible. So this is something that the sun doesn't set without the dog getting an MRI and surgery. If it's the middle of the day, we rearrange our, our, our schedules. If it's you know the middle of the night, we're coming back in for it. So this is something that we don't want to to wait on. And it puts us in this stinky situation where um, it's, a, I don't know if you, if you said, it's, it's about a 10 to 15% chance um, of it happening in a dog that's category five. So we're in this situation whenever we meet a dog that is paraplegic no deep pain, where there's the scenario that we're in a rush to do surgery because it's an emergency, but we do surgery and three, four, five, six, seven days later, we start seeing symptoms of myelomalacia. Um, with regards to does it ever stop, um, it's typically progressive. To, to me, as a rule, it's progressive. And once it starts, um, it doesn't stop. I, I, I have dogs where you know it's moving really, really slow, it seems. So when we're testing that cutaneous trunk eye reflex, it's really slow and then it sort of accelerates. Um, ones where it starts off really fast and then kind of stops. Ones where it's, um, excuse me, where it slows but keeps progressing. Um, I've had some where it goes really quick, kind of slows down and then speeds up again. Um, but have I ever had a dog uh, that was showing signs of myelomalacia or ascending myelomalacia where it stopped? And I have, I've had five dogs where it started and you know these, these uh, pet parents were sort of primed for it and before surgery that it's a possibility after surgery, we see the cutaneous trunk eye reflex moving forward, the reflexes we lose. Um, and that's when we start saying, I'm concerned your dog um, 
is, is uh, showing signs of myelomalacia, the thing that we had talked about could potentially happen. Um, we're waiting until the thoracic limbs uh, show weakness, because to me, that's kind of the point of, of even if it stopped after that, as a dog that is unable to use all four limbs, four legs, uh, that's not a um, typically a good quality of life. So I've, I've had five dogs where it started and then just stopped. Those dogs um, are permanently paraplegic, no deep pain. So there's no regaining ambulation, no regaining um, uh, fecal or urinary continence, but but the dogs you know lived. So I'm 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 often saying, you know, when I've got that dog that's showing signs of myelomalacia, talking to that client, you know, I, I hope I pray that your pet is going to be number six that has started and stopped, but the likelihood is that it's going to start and not stop, and we're going to be faced with tough decisions in the next day or two or or less. Um, and if your dog is, you know, miracle number six where it stops, um, we will be in a wheelchair and we will need, you know, urinary uh, bladder expressions, et cetera. So um, I have had a handful that, that have stopped. I don't have a good handle on why they stopped. Um, so it, it wasn't that we treated any in one way or the other. Um, I, I can't remember all of the breeds, um, but. And two of, two of them were French Bulldogs, um, which we tend to see myelomalacia uh, in just more frequently than other breeds. So, um, so for Charlotte's question, um, is myelomalacia always fatal? You know, no, but it's almost always fatal. And um, we, we, we should be prepared as, as neurologists, as veterinarians, and as, you know, pet owners that if it starts, the rule is that it's not going to stop and it is going to be something where we're going to have to euthanize that pet before the thoracic, excuse me, before the, um, the, the, the nerves that supply the diaphragm become affected or be, before breathing becomes affected. Um, and can, can it stop before it ascends too far? You know, yes, but again, those are the, 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 the less than 1%. Um, and I, I wish I, I knew how to stop it, um, but I don't think anybody has that right. Um, yeah, I think we can do some of these pretty quick. So Miriam says, dog has suspected myelitis, paralyzed in three legs six weeks ago. Steroid treatment has taken its toll and we're having to lower the dosage already. His progress has went back, lost control of his bowels and his legs are getting worse. Any suggestions? Um, so th th this is something that I, I would absolutely go see your veterinarian and or a neurologist if, if your pet is um, paralyzed and, and getting worse. Um, you know, this is something that my, my ability to help is, is relatively limited, you know, through, through the internet. It's something that um, your dog's best chances are being evaluated um, for the severity, uh, evaluated for what the possible causes are other than, other than myelitis um, and is there anything else that we can be doing test-wise to find out what the cause is so that we can be treating more aggressively? 12-year-old dog on Kepra since January for seizures. She's at the max dose for her weight. She's been having cluster seizures for the last three days, lasting about 30 seconds and having them every six to seven hours. Is there another medication that can be added to Kepra to control the seizures? Uh, for, for me, uh, I'll let you do the next one. I'm just, just rolling with it, sorry. Okay. Um, for, for, for me, the question becomes, what's the underlying cause of the seizures? If your dog is 12 years old and just started having seizures, we have to ask, um, is this epilepsy or is this you know, uh, hypoglycemia secondary to an insulin? Or do we have low blood sugar? Um, do we have a brain tumor or something like that? So yes, part of the treatment, regardless of the underlying cause, is going to be anti-seizure medications to uh, treat the symptom of the seizures, but to me, um, step one is looking for the underlying cause of the seizures, uh, which we've kind of detailed out for a couple different times here, of looking for things outside of the brain, things inside of the brain. Um, are there other medications? Um, yes. Uh, one of the medications would be treating the underlying cause. So if it's low blood sugar, we're treating that one way. If it's 
a brain tumor, you know, there are medications that we can add for, for that sort of treatment. Um, so, and then are there other anti-seizure medications? Yes, um, there are plenty of them. Keppra is one of our um, go-to medications, uh, first-line medications, but there are other ones. Again, to me, the, um, the, the biggest recommendation here would be you know, seeing your veterinarian and or a neurologist to try and rule out some things as causes of seizures so that we can specifically uh, treat for, for your pup. Um, Dr. DeVita, Jackie says, my dog was diagnosed with vestibular syndrome, possibly due to an ear infection, even though no infection was detected on her, presumably um, from, from physical examination. She's 10 years old. Uh, I want to know, is this a situation, is this, does this situation have any secondary effect on her or if I need to take any precautions with her? I want to clean her teeth, but I'm afraid to sedate her due to the situation. So I guess approach to vestibular disease causes and then uh, anesthesia and vestibular disease. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll kind of pose hypothetical questions to Jackie about her dog in just a moment, but just to talk about vestibular disease in, in dogs and cats. Um, vestibular disease is just a problem affecting the balance system or the balance center. Um, so vestibular is a fancy word for the balance system. Um, some of the clinical signs that we can see um, that Jackie might be referring to are things like head tilts and um, being off balance and, and kind of walking um, like they're drunk or, or kind of leaning and listing to one side or another. Um, we can see dogs having abnormal eye movements, um, what we call nystagmus. Um, so all of those things are, are likely what, what Jackie's dog was exhibiting. I don't think um, she described the signs specifically, but that's what we'd be worried about. And there are two portions of the vestibular system. The first portion is called the peripheral vestibular system, and uh, that's a, a section outside of the brain that can affect our balance. Um, that's composed of the middle and inner part of the ear, and there's a nerve that connects um, kind of the middle and inner part of the ear to the brain. So um, when we're talking about the ear as well, something that's really important to remember is that we can't see that portion from the outside of the body. So uh, presumably if your eardrum is intact, that's as far as a veterinarian can see into a dog or cat's ear. And that middle and inner portion lies behind the eardrum. So we're unable to visualize it um, just from external examination. The second part of the vestibular system is in the brain, in the back part of the brain. Um, and so again, that nerve connects the, the peripheral portion, the outside of the brain portion, and the central portion or the inside of the brain portion of the controls for balance within the body. Um, and so, you know, some of the things that would affect a peripheral or that would cause a peripheral vestibular disease would be ear infections or um, ear tumors. We can have polyps uh, more commonly in cats, so little benign growths in the ear that cause those balance problems. Um, we can also have what's called idiopathic vestibular disease. Um, and, and similar to idiopathic epilepsy, we've kind of, in that scenario, ruled out all the possible underlying active diseases for the causes. I usually liken that to vertigo in people. Um, and then we have the inside of the brain problems, which uh, tend to be the more sinister problems. So things like strokes and things like brain tumors and, and again, infections and meningitis or encephalitis, congenital malformations, not quite as much. Um, and in, in Jackie's dog in particular at 10 years old, I think would be unlikely, but um, there's a wide variety of things essentially affecting both of those parts of the body that can cause vestibular syndrome or vestibular disease. Um, so, you know, I, I guess part of the, the initial question as we've kind of mentioned a few times are, is what's the underlying cause? Um, so, you know, has Jackie's dog gotten better with, um, with treatment employed? I'm not sure if you had mentioned that, um, you know, and, and did we take some antibiotics and things like that? What, what treatments were employed? Um, but ultimately knowing the underlying cause will help us to best know, you know, um, what, you know, how to treat, what the prognosis is, what the long-term expectations are, and then to answer the question of what's the risk for potential anesthesia as well. Um, I guess one of the things I, I forgot to mention was, you know, something outside of the nervous system in general, like a low thyroid level. So 
um, that can also make our dogs have vestibular syndrome or vestibular problems. So that's something else that your veterinarian could check on blood work. Ultimately, some of those scenarios are more risky for anesthesia than others. Um, so a middle or inner ear infection is probably less risky for anesthesia. However, anesthesia may cause exacerbation of those signs. Um, so any dog that has a neurologic problem, um, specifically a balance problem, I always warn owners, if we're putting them under anesthesia, they will potentially look worse following anesthesia. Um, you know, worse being more off balance, more wobbly, have a, a worsening head tilt or worsening nystagmus. Um, but it would be hard to make a recommendation in regards to the safety of anesthesia without knowing, you know, is this a, an ear problem? Is this a brain problem? Has it resolved? Has it not resolved? Um, so I think there, those are some, some particulars that we would um, defer to your veterinarian in regards to what the risk is. The last thing I'll mention is that um, there are definitely medications for neurologic patients in general, um, anesthetic medications that are safer than others. So, um, you know, letting your veterinarian know, you know, whether it's, you know, veterinary now or in the future, my dog had a neurologic problem in the past. And if you're putting my dog under anesthesia, I just want to let you know that so that you can make the best anesthetic protocol. I think that's really important as well. Uh, last one, Jessica says, my dog has epilepsy and had her first cluster three days ago. What causes clusters? Also, she was put on Keppra. Can you help me with some background information about this medication? So, um, epilepsy, let, let's, for, for argument's sake, assume that we're, we're an epileptic and di diagnosed epilepsy, so we don't have to re rehash that, but let's assume we're, we're truly an epileptic diagnosed and uh, clusters three days ago, um, I guess causes of clusters and uh, I guess approach to clusters. Um, so again, really, really quick, um, seizures are, are abnormal electrical activity in the front part of the brain. Um, dogs with any condition that cause seizures can have progression and that includes idiopathic epilepsy. Um, so we do see a percentage of dogs that just have worsening seizures over time. Um, one of the things I like to remind owners about uh, of dogs who have seizures are that once the brain has a seizure, once that abnormal electrical activity occurs, um, it kind of sets the brain up to have more abnormal electrical activity. Um, so that's something referred to as the kindling effect, like kindling on a fire. So if we throw more kindling on that fire, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, essentially. Um, so when we have cluster seizures, um, you know, it's kind of that, that seizure activity, that abnormal electrical activity is just getting essentially out of control. Um, and, and I'm trying to keep it to a, a brief explanation, but hopefully that makes sense. Um, that, you know, that abnormal electrical activity is just continuing and being perpetuated within the brain. Um, oftentimes I in particular prefer to um, make rescue plans for dogs who are known cluster seizure patients. Um, so that sometimes involves what we call pulse therapy of medication. So um, giving a medication for a few days following a seizure to try and again, quell that abnormal electrical activity before it's allowed to get um, severe enough or, or quote, out of control enough to cause a cluster. Some people will use other types of rescue medications at home. So um, we, we use here medications that are put into the nose that are similar to what we'd be able to give intravenously in the hospital to try and again, stop those seizures. The shorter the seizure is and the um, less amount of seizures that are occurring, the less likelihood that a dog will continue to have seizures within that time frame, that 24 hour time frame. Um, and, and so in the event of, of a cluster seizure, I would absolutely chat with your veterinarian about, you know, is there a medication? Is there, do you have a preference for cluster management? What can I do? Um, because we shouldn't stay on those rescue medications long-term they're not maintenance medications. They're not likely to help with long-term uh, severity or frequency of seizures, but in the short term can be quite effective. Keppra um, in particular is one of our newer, but also potentially safer seizure medications to start with. Um, so it, it's a medication that is uh, utilized by uh, molecules in the blood as opposed to being going through the liver or the kidneys. Um, so 
it doesn't necessarily affect the liver and the kidneys like some other medications would or, or other organs in the body. Um, it doesn't necessarily require as much monitoring as some of our other medications. Um, and it's generally well tolerated. Any seizure medication can cause things like sedation and a little bit of ataxia or drunkenness to the gait. Um, but that's usually transient and usually dogs do recover well from that. One of my other favorite things about Kepler is that it's got such a wide safe dose range um, that we can really dose escalate. So of course we always start at the most modest dose and trying to find that lowest effective dose, but we have a lot of room to increase Kepler typically before we've maxed out. Um, and one of the other things I tell people is that we don't often max out in terms of safety, we often max out in terms of efficacy. So there becomes a point where I often say, sure, we can safely increase this, but it's not likely to provide an improvement in the seizure control past this point. Um, so I like Kepra. I typically start with it in most scenarios just because it is so safe, um, because it is one of the ones that I wouldn't require as much monitoring as some of our other options, but there are definitely other options for seizure control. Um, and I guess the, the short answer to that is there are specific protocols for, for rescue medications at home to try and avoid the cluster scenario and to try to avoid hospitalization. If your pet is having more than one seizure in a 24 hour period, um, they're absolutely a, a candidate for those protocols. Um, but also we should, should be cognizant about seeking emergency veterinary care or at least contacting our veterinarian um, because the more seizures they have, the more they can kind of go into, and we want to avoid that situation um, to avoid, you know, having more difficulties getting them out of that. I think that's Super. Cool. All righty. Well, that is it for today. Thanks, everyone. And thank you, Dr. DeVita. Anytime. All right. <laughs> Bye, everyone.